Hi, I'm Susan Tierney and this is Scott Horn and we're with the Owner Finance Network and this is episode 23 of Ask the Attorney and in this episode we are going to talk all about RMLOs because there's so much information and so many questions and so much misinformation and confusion. So Scott, what is an RMLO? Well, it depends on what part of the industry you're talking about out there, but an RMLO, of course, stands for a Residential Mortgage Loan Originator. Now, sometimes that could be someone who's licensed to be a, a loan officer, maybe a mortgage broker, but in the creative finance world, the RMLO is the loan processor. That's their okay. sole role, is to process a consumer or a home buyer. Okay, so then who is an RMLO? Well, anyone can be an RMLO, but you have to be licensed. Okay. Meaning you need to go take your classes and whatnot, take your test, and you get a national MNLS license that then allows you to become an RMLO. Now, there, there's a lot more to that than just getting licensed. There's all the other things that go into that, knowing what is required okay. of an RMLO, how to, what their, their um, processing requirements are, storing of documents, and things of this nature along the way. So what are the licensing requirements then in Texas and in other states? Is it different in every state? How does well, that work? I, I don't know 100%, but you have to go to class so you learn about mortgage, uh, the, the mortgage industry. And then, of course, you're going to take a test. And that test is going to be a national test today. That's going to be probably pretty uniform, I think, throughout the country. And you obtain a national license. Now, just because you have a national okay. license, doesn't mean that you can automatically go and become an RMLO in Arizona or Florida or Ohio or where it might be. You have to be licensed in each state. So you might be a licensed RMLO in Texas, but just because you're licensed here doesn't mean you can originate a loan or process a loan in, let's say, Arizona. You have to be licensed there. And that's where the differentiation is mm. going to come from. And then I think each state's going to have some type of a government regulation committee, like here in Texas, is the Texas uh, Mortgage and Savings and Lending, I think, um, department controls that. And every state's okay. going to be a little bit different out there about that. And we just got to meet with those rules and regulations. That's why I just, it, although it's a national license, each state's going to have a little bit of control also in that regard. Okay. So tell us, what is the role of an RMLO in the owner finance world? It is. And let's be very narrowed in our focus here because we don't really care about the whole overall mortgage industry. We care about the owner finance world. And in the owner finance world, job one is to accumulate and to gather financial information on a prospective borrower put it into the, the uh, computer systems that we utilize, and provide our seller, who is the lender in most cases, the financial package on that borrower, so that that seller or lender can make a determination of whether they wish to approve that borrower for the transaction or not. Okay, and what, what does an RMLO need to get from the borrower to process that? Well, I mean, first off, we're gonna get probably a standard 1003 application. It's a standard family application. Mm -hmm. They're going to ask for tax returns. They're going to ask for W-2s. Maybe they'll ask for bank statements. Maybe they'll ask for other income sources that might be out there along the way. You know, so often you run across situations where um, borrowers, a traditional borrower may have a social security number. That's great. That's going to be a little bit easier to process probably. But then you run into the ITIN person, uh, that might be a little more difficult. But hopefully we still can get the application and tax returns and things of that nature. But what about someone who comes in who might be illegal? Mm -hmm. Can they still buy a house here? They can. There's some rules and regulations about that from a legal perspective, I think. But they can still do it. But what I see so often out there is, is where a problem arises because the buyer cannot provide evidence of all of their income. Right. And that's the hard part where you have to put this together, okay? Yeah. Um, that might require not just an application where they're providing it to you, saying, hey, this is what I'm making. Because one of the things that a seller of a property with this, one of the rules and regulations under the Dodd-Frank Act is to consider and verify a borrower's 
financial information. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can't verify it independently, how do you do it? Well, right. maybe I can get from you, Susan, an application, and I'm going to trust that what you're putting on here is accurate and correct because you're telling me this. Right. But maybe you are, you're a maid and you're paid in cash. Can we go to various um, of your clients and ask them to provide a letter stating how you work for them? Or maybe you're in the landscape industry or other things, or construction industry where you're paid in cash. Can we go to uh, your employer and get something to help evidence and to support what you're making? Maybe through utility bills is a way of doing it, showing you're actually paying them, or through your rental agreement where you're living currently, hmm. where you're able to show, I'm paying rent of 1000 a month, I'm paying my utilities here. And you start to paint the picture and put it all together as best we can so that the seller, lender, investor has the ability to look at reasonable information out there. And so the RMLO may have the easy task of just an application and tax returns and maybe some W-2s and it all comes together. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side where it's a little bit more work right. to do those Especially things. Especially if, uh, if they don't have a social security and they don't have an I-10 and they're technically illegal, we can still gather all that information. Sure. Yeah, so you can not, not hmm. be a citizen of the United States in order to buy real estate here. There are issues that when that person goes to sell that real estate, mm -hmm. there's going to be a deduction that the IRS requires. Yeah, okay. So we know what an RMLO does. Mm -hmm. What do they not do? Because you're very clear about, you know, what they can and can't do. They do. Well, so often, too many RMLOs try to insert themselves into a real estate transaction to, mm -hmm. and I hate to use it this way, to make themselves feel more important. You know, prior to the SAFE Act and the Dodd-Frank Act 2009, we'd never really processed a buyer. Now, here at my companies, we've always processed buyers. We did it internally. Mm -hmm. It was just something we decided to do. Most people didn't do it. Now it has, it's become basically mandatory to do it out there. And so what we don't want to do is we don't want that arm low. Uh, as I said earlier, their primary job is to gather financial information from the borrower mm -hmm. to provide it to a seller to make an informed decision. But so often, arm lows get asked to help structure the deal, put the deal together. What should, should my sales price be? What should mm -hmm. my down payment right. be? What should my interest rate be? And really that should be the lender's decision and how to do that to a, a certain degree out there. Mm -hmm. um, next, you know, an arm low is not there to approve a buyer. That is the seller lender responsibility because yeah. the seller lender is an underwriter right. season. And that's but, where they need to do this. Yeah, and you know, and I have people will, who will ask me after we do their package, that, that our investors, that will say, well, what do you think? Should I approve them? Well, I mean, you can provide a generalized answer, but you're not the RMLO. And an RMLO's license doesn't go to that. Okay. okay. That's where the seller has to take on that responsibility. Maybe that, that seller or lender has an attorney to go to to help them make those decisions out there. But the RMLO, simply is, their license doesn't go there in that, in that instance. Now, the RMLO is not there to approve legal documents. Right. That's not their role. That's the attorney's role in that instance. You know, what about drafting disclosure agreements, closing disclosures? Can they do that? Absolutely. So, yes. Now, should they draft contract disclosures or mm -hmm. things that are used at the closing? No. That becomes into the legal domain. Okay. But a closing disclosure, a CD as we call it out there, which is the settlement statement, can an arm do that? Absolutely. Now, what I found intriguing is, is most closing agents that I know of, such as in my office and our title offices, we prepare the closing disclosure. It, it just goes right along with the transaction. It's built into the whole, the whole uh, overall fee structure. But I see a lot of RMLOs who are wanting to draft the closing disclosure for their client, which can be done, but they're getting billed for it. And so the individual seller uh, investor needs to decide what they want to do, pay for it or not pay for it out there in that instance. Okay. Um, what about the value of an RMLO? How valuable are they to the deal, to the, to the, you know, 
to the end result. No, well, I think it's very valuable today out there. You know, first and foremost, I like to keep things customary and ordinary. Mm -hmm. And if a traditional home buyer is going to buy a home and get a traditional mortgage, they're going to go to a mortgage company where they're going to get processed. Now, so often you get into the investor world, you hear about kitchen tabletop closings. Mm -hmm. uh, things are done very quickly. They don't, they don't, they don't lose standard channels. Whenever you can go through a standardized channel, it just customizes and, or, and it, it just makes the transaction feel normal. And we mm -hmm. want to normalize it. Mm -hmm. And it makes the buyer go, oh, this is just like everybody else I hear getting a loan. Right. We're getting processed through the same process. So I like that first and foremost. It also helps us stay compliant. We didn't have to use to deal with compliance, as I said, prior to 2009, 2010, but now we do. Right. We've got to deal with the Dodd-Frank Act, with the SAFE Act, and with RESPA, the Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act. And the RMLO, when they process that buyer, and they provide them the disclosures required under RESPA, mm -hmm. they provide the lender that financial package, it helps them to stay compliant with those issues. You know, oftentimes when I'm talking to people, I call this idiot proofing the transaction because I don't have time to think about all of this. And even though I may not be required to do it because there is a three property de minimis rule under RESPA and there's five property de minimis rule under Dodd-Frank. The SAFE Act here in Texas, we do have a five property de minimis rule, but other states have a zero, meaning every deal you must use an RMLO. Mm -hmm. I get it. But staying compliant is great. But you, you your advice would be to always use one. Absolutely. Not to wait till you got five <clears throat> deals. Uh, well, I do it that way because I don't want to think about it. Yeah. I want to do it right. I want to take care of the buyer. I want to make things customary and ordinary for everybody out there. Mm -hmm. And the more I can do that, I think the better the transaction is. Right. And lastly, I think there's a lot of people out there who are selling mortgages. The mortgage industry and buying of owner financed mortgages was very big back in the late 80s or the 1990s. Mm -hmm. That kind of died off in the uh, 2000s in the subprime era, as we'll call it, and it totally mm -hmm. collapsed in uh, 08, 09 when the real estate crash hit. Mm -hmm. But it's coming back. But because we have all these compliance issues, we have these federal mandates with Dodd-Frank, the SAFE Act, and with um, uh, RESPA, and other states could have some basic requirements too. I think most note buyers, they're going to want to see that processing package. They're going to want to know that the loan was originated properly and correctly. Right. Now, I get it that things may have changed. So if you processed a loan on, say, 20, January 1st of 2021, and three or four years go by, of course the financial situation of that borrower may have changed. But what you have is, is you have a pay history to help supplant that. But what you can do is you can determine that at least the loan was originated properly and correctly in the beginning. You look at the pay history showing a good payment uh, structure along the way. That is what helps you sell that mortgage and maximize your profit. So I think because of that, using an Armolo is hugely important. So I just hope everybody in our audience out there realizes that, mm -hmm. they use one, they don't ask too much of the Armolo along the way and realize what is their role. They're not there to be your attorney. They're there to process that buyer, and that is truly their singular role in the owner finance world. Okay, awesome. Well, we we have an in-house RMLO, Sylvia, and uh, you can go to our website at www.theownerfinancenetwork.com and scroll down to RMLO, and um, you can an uh, ask us any questions you'd like. Uh, on the website and we'll get them answered for you. So thank you for joining us and we will see you next week in episode 24.